Picture this, you're unconscious during surgery, completely unaware. Or are you? New research shows your brain is still processing pain and sensations, even under anesthesia. What else is your mind doing without your knowledge? Stay tuned as we dive into the unsettling world of consciousness. Hello, my curious cortexes. You're tuned into another mind-bending exploration of the human brain. Today, we're joined by neuroscience experts to unpack some truly fascinating discoveries about consciousness, anesthesia, and the hidden workings of our minds. What they've found might make you question everything you think you know about your own awareness. Welcome back for another deep dive. This time, we're taking on something, well, pretty big, consciousness. Hmm. And get this, we're going to be looking at it from a clinical practice perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, how can understanding consciousness mm -hmm. actually make for better medical care? Yeah, it really is this fascinating kind of cross-section of neuroscience and anesthesiology, right? We're basically yeah. trying to figure out what makes us, you know, conscious. Yeah. And then how anesthetics can just, like switch that off at least for a little while exactly we're talking about what makes you you that ability mm -hmm. to experience the world around you to think feel remember mm -hmm. it all seems so i don't know effortless right but what's actually happening in our brains to make it work and what can we learn when anesthesia kind of throws a wrench in those processes well the research that we're going to be looking at today comes from mit's pick our institute and they're really going deep into brain waves okay and you know brain waves are kind of how different parts of your brain can actually talk to each other right they form these networks and patterns so it's not just like random electrical activity going on yeah these brain waves have different frequencies, different rhythms. Yeah, yeah. And those rhythms change depending on if we're awake, if we're sleeping, or like we're going to talk about, under anesthesia. Absolutely. You got it. It's like your brain is constantly humming. Like it's always doing something. Different parts of your brain are specialized for different tasks. Right. But the brain waves are like the um, the conductor, making sure everything's working together yeah. smoothly. So then when we talk about losing consciousness, Mm -hmm. It's not like the brain just goes completely quiet. Right. It's more like this, I don't know, this beautiful symphony of brain waves get yeah, disrupted. You're exactly right. And different anesthetics mess with that communication, but in different ways. Okay. So, for instance, propofol mm -hmm. is a really common anesthetic. It seems to create this state where the brain activity is unstable. It's almost like the brain's trying to organize itself, but keeps getting interrupted. And that's what leads to the loss of consciousness. Okay. That's really interesting. I, I always kind of imagine anesthesia is like muting the brain. Right, right. Not necessarily making it like unstable. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely more nuanced than that. Yeah. And it's kind of why just, you know, looking at someone's physical responses isn't always enough. Right. We have right. to actually understand the brain's, I guess, electrical conversation. Yeah. And so by measuring brainwave patterns, anesthesiologists can get a much clearer picture of what's actually going on during, say, surgery. That makes a lot of sense. Right. Think of it like this. Instead of just hitting the mute button on your brain, anesthesia is more like scrambling the signal. Your brain's still trying to communicate, but the messages keep getting jumbled up. Kind of unnerving when you think about it, right? So that brings us to the clinical applications of all this. Mm -hmm. Imagine being able to adjust anesthesia in real time. Oh, yeah. Based on like the patient's own unique brain activity. That could be amazing for safety and you. like how they recover. Absolutely. And researchers are working on systems to do just that. They can monitor these brain waves during surgery. Yeah. And then the anesthesiologist can really fine tune the dose and potentially, you know, even minimize those side effects we sometimes see from anesthesia. So we're moving from a one-size-fits-all approach to something much more personalized, thanks to a better understanding of consciousness. And, you know, what's really cool is this isn't just about making anesthesia better. It's yeah. giving us fundamental insights into how consciousness works, period. So how do we get from, like, brain waves yeah. to that conscious experience that we're all so familiar with? Well, one of the key pieces of the puzzle is this thing called predictive coding. Okay. Essentially, our brains are constantly making predictions about the world. Yeah. And they're using our past experiences to do that. Right. 
And that helps us filter out the stuff that's familiar and focus on what's unexpected. So if I walk into my living room and there's a kangaroo jumping on the couch, that's going to get my attention. It violates like my brain's prediction of what should be in my living room. Exactly. And research has shown that anesthesia, it disrupts that predictive coding process. Yeah. So the brain, it struggles to like distinguish between what it expects and what it doesn't expect because the communication pathways that are needed to make those accurate predictions, well, they've been disrupted. OK, so under anesthesia, our brain might still be picking up on sensory information, but it's not really making sense of it in the same way because the prediction engine is offline. Exactly. Like the brain's getting data, but can't really figure out how to make sense of it in the context of its own internal model of the world. This is so fascinating. OK, now we know that the brain isn't just a single blob, right? Yeah, it has all these different regions, these different specialties. Mm -hmm. So how do these regions work together to create consciousness? Mm -hmm. And how does that change when someone's under anesthesia? You can think of it like a hierarchy. So you've got your sensory regions there towards the back of the brain. OK, they handle processing, you know, basic information from our senses. And that information then gets passed up to higher level regions like your frontal cortex. Right. Which handles, you know, more complex thinking, planning, decision making, all that stuff. So my eyes see a delicious donut, but it's my frontal cortex that decides if I should actually eat it. Precisely. And under anesthesia, the communication between those areas breaks down. OK. So your sensory regions, they might still be detecting stuff, but the message isn't getting through to the frontal regions for you to be consciously aware of it. So even though all the parts are still there, they're not working together the same way. Kind of like if you have all the ingredients for a cake, but you forget to turn on the oven. Here's what's wild. Your brain is basically running a constant simulation of reality comparing what it expects to find against what it actually sees. When those predictions are wrong, like finding a kangaroo on your couch, it's like your brain hitting the panic button. Under anesthesia, that whole prediction system gets thrown into chaos. That's a great analogy. And that's where these different frequencies of brain waves come in. So your lower frequency waves, like alpha and beta waves, they seem to be carrying predictions from those frontal regions down to the sensory regions. OK. And then the higher frequency gamma waves, those signal back when a prediction's wrong. So it's like this constant back and forth between different parts of the brain using these different brain wave rhythms to organize it all. Exactly. This makes me think of that concept you mentioned before, spatial computing. How does that fit in? Spatial computing is a really interesting theory that suggests that the different frequencies of brain waves work together in this very specific way that allows for conscious thought. Okay. It proposes that beta waves, they actually act like these stencils, hmm. kind of guiding where those faster gamma waves can encode new information. So beta waves are like the outline and then the gamma waves come in and fill in the details. Exactly. Like, you know, a coloring book. Beta waves lay down the lines and the gamma waves bring the color. I like that. So that mechanism, that could yeah. be really important for how we blend sensory information with our thoughts, our intentions. Like if I'm trying to remember a phone number, the beta waves are holding the general structure in my mind and the gamma waves are encoding the specific digits. You got it. Exactly. Wow. It's incredible. I mean, we're talking about a level of coordination that's, I don't know, it's mind boggling. But if our consciousness relies on these predictable patterns, does that mean that all of our decisions are already predetermined? Ah, see, now you're getting into the really big questions. Right. The philosophical ones that people have been debating for centuries. And this research definitely adds a whole other layer to it all. Yeah, it's definitely something to think about. But before we get too deep into philosophy, let's take a minute to appreciate the clinical side of all this. Okay. I mean, if we can figure out how anesthesia disrupts consciousness at this level, it could lead to some really amazing advancements for patients. It really could. Yeah, it has the potential to really change how we think about and use anesthesia. And the research coming out of the Picower Institute is giving us some real concrete evidence of this. For example, they did a study looking at how the brain reacts to surprises. OK, hold on. Surprises. What does that even mean in like a, a scientific study? Are they jumping out and yelling boo at lab rats? Yeah. Uh huh. No, no, it's a little more subtle than that. They used a simple auditory task. The animals listened to these sequences of tones, and most of the time, the tones were predictable. But every now and then, they'd throw in a tone that wasn't expected. The surprise. Ah, so setting up an expectation and then breaking it. 
Yeah. Gotcha. But how does that tell us anything about consciousness? Well, they saw some really interesting differences in brain activity depending on if the animal was awake or anesthetized. When the animals were awake, there was a clear pattern of communication between two parts of the brain. One, the temporoparietal area, that's the one that handles sensory information. And two, the frontal eye fields, which are involved in a higher level of cognitive functions. Okay, so one part of the brain picks up on the surprise and then another part figures out what to do about it. Right, exactly. But here's the thing. When they anesthetized the animals, the sensory region still picked up on the surprise. You could actually see it in the brain waves. There was this spike in gamma wave activity, which we know is linked to processing new or unexpected stuff. But the frontal region, nothing, no response. So the brain's registering the surprise, but it's not becoming like a conscious thought. Right. It's like the message is being sent, but no one's on the other end to receive it. Wow. This really drives home how important the communication between those brain regions is for consciousness, doesn't it? It really does. Like the sensory parts might be doing their job, but without that higher level processing in the frontal regions, we don't consciously experience it. It reminds me of that other idea we talked about, predictive routing. Yes. How does that fit into this? So predictive routing, that's kind of the brain's way of being efficient. Instead of treating every single thing our senses pick up as brand new information, it uses predictions based on past experiences. It streamlines the whole process. So my brain's basically saying, okay, I've seen a living room before. I know what to expect here. Unless, of course, there's a kangaroo hopping around, I can pretty much ignore most of this. Exactly. And it looks like that filtering process really depends on the interplay between those lower frequency alpha and beta waves, which carry the predictions, and the higher frequency gamma waves, which flag anything that goes against those predictions. When something unexpected happens, those gamma waves signal to the frontal lobes like, hey, pay attention, something's not right here. But under anesthesia, those lines of communication get all messed up. Exactly. Anesthesia disrupts that predictive routing, so the brain can't really tell the difference between what it expects and what it doesn't. It's like yeah. it loses its ability to prioritize, and everything starts to seem equally important. I see. And that might be why people sometimes feel disoriented or have those weird thoughts and perceptions as they're coming out of anesthesia. Their brain's struggling to make sense of everything because the usual filtering system is still kind of rebooting. Wow, that's fascinating. It's like the brain's filing system is temporarily out of whack. All the information's there, but not being sorted the right way. That's a good way to put it. And this takes us right back to that idea that consciousness isn't just on or off. Mm -hmm. It's this delicate balance, this intricate dance between different parts of the brain, the communication pathways, and those brainwave patterns. Mess with any part of that system and you change conscious awareness. Okay, so we talked about how this research could lead to better anesthesia. But I'm curious about, like, the bigger picture. What other clinical applications could come out of understanding consciousness better? Oh, tons. One really exciting area is brain-computer interfaces. They can monitor brain activity in real time during surgery, not just for anesthesia, but for all kinds of things. Imagine being able to spot signs of trouble in the brain before they even show up on those regular monitors. That sounds straight out of sci-fi. We'd yeah. be reading the brain's mind to provide better care. Yeah, in a sense. And there's also a lot of research into using brain stimulation techniques, uh -huh. things like transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS, and they're using it to actually modulate brain activity during and after surgery. And this could potentially help people recover from anesthesia faster, manage pain better, maybe even treat some neurological conditions. It feels like we're on the verge of a whole new era in medicine. Yeah. One where we can really interact with the brain in ways we never thought possible. I think so too. This is all happening right now and the possibilities are really incredible. Yeah. But as with any powerful tool, we have to think about the ethics. Right. How do we make sure these technologies are used responsibly, that they benefit everyone? And how do we protect patients' privacy in a world where we can potentially see into their minds? Those are really important questions and definitely ones we need to address as we move forward. But for now, I'm just blown away by how much progress we're making in understanding consciousness. Me too. It really is this fundamental part of what makes us human. Yeah, and it never stops being amazing. Okay, so we've covered a lot. We have. Brainwaves, predictive coding, anesthesia, even some pretty deep philosophical questions. Yeah. But I've been wondering about that transition between being conscious and unconscious. Is it like a sudden flip of a switch or more of a gradual thing? It's a great question, and it kind of depends. Some anesthetics, like propofol, 
yeah, they can make it happen pretty quickly, almost like flipping a switch. But others, like ketamine, it's more gradual for states of consciousness on the way. But like a dimmer switch instead of an on-off switch. Exactly. And it's not just the drug itself. It's also how it's given and the individual person. All those things factor in. Makes sense. So it's really about personalized medicine, isn't it? Yeah. Tailoring the treatment to each patient. Absolutely. You know, I know we've been focusing on the clinical side, but I can't help but think about the philosophical implications, too. We talk about how our brains are always making predictions and how consciousness seems to come from this whole complex interaction in the brain. Right. Does that mean our choice is already made for us? Like, where does free will even fit in? That is the question, isn't it? It's a question people have been trying to answer for a long, long time. And this research definitely adds a new wrinkle to it all. If consciousness is just the result of predictable patterns in our brains, does that leave any room for us to make our own choices? Or are we basically just very complex machines running on a pre-programmed script? Wow. It's kind of a mind-blowing thing to consider. And it makes you wonder about the relationship between the brain and the mind, doesn't it? Is consciousness just a product of the physical brain? Or is there something more to it, something that goes beyond the material world? Those are some deep questions. And honestly, science may never be able to fully answer them. But the research we've been talking about today, it at least gives us a glimpse into the amazing complexity and beauty of the human brain and how it creates this incredibly special thing consciousness. It's truly humbling. It makes you appreciate being alive and aware, you know. I agree. Consciousness is a gift, one we should definitely cherish and keep exploring with that sense of wonder. I love that. Well said. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about something that's usually associated with consciousness, dreams. Do we know how they're formed? What role do they play in our conscious experience? That's another fascinating area of research. We don't have all the answers yet, but we do know that most dreaming happens during REM sleep. Right, right. That's the sleep stage with the rapid eye movements and all the brain activity. Mm -hmm. And there are theories out there that dreams might actually be a way for us to consolidate memories or process emotions. So even though we're not consciously aware of it, our brains are still busy working things out while we sleep. That's one possibility. But dreams, they're really hard to study, partly because they're so subjective and fleeting. Mm. It's tough to get accurate descriptions of dreams. And even when you do, figuring out what they mean is a whole other challenge. It's like trying to hold on to a handful of sand. The harder you squeeze, the more slips through your fingers. That's a great way to put it. But even with all those challenges, researchers are making progress in figuring out the neural basis of dreams. That's great. And as brain imaging techniques get better, we're getting closer to understanding what's really happening in that mysterious world of dreaming. That's exciting. Well, this has been an incredible deep dive into consciousness. We've covered so much. Brain waves, predictive coding, anesthesia, even some pretty mind-bending philosophical questions. It really has been a great discussion, and I hope everyone listening has come away with a deeper appreciation for how complex and wonderful consciousness really is. Me too. <laughs> this is a topic that never ceases to amaze me, and I can't wait to see what the future holds for our understanding of this fundamental part of being human. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see where this research leads. You know, it's really wild when you think about just how much is happening in our brains that we're not even aware of. I know, right? We go through our days making decisions, doing things, experiencing the world, but we rarely actually stop and think about all the crazy, intricate stuff happening in our brains to make it all possible. Yeah, and, and something that really fascinates me is how easily this whole delicate system can be disrupted. Oh, definitely. And we, and we talk about anesthesia, obviously. But, right. But are there, like, other situations where consciousness is altered or even, you know, completely shut off? For sure. For sure. Think about sleep, for example. Hmm. We spend like a third of our lives in this totally different state of consciousness, but we're only just starting to understand why we even sleep and, and what it does to our brains. It's true. It's like we go through these different cycles during sleep, each one with its own unique brainwave patterns and, and different things going on cognitively. Yeah. Some stages we have those vivid dreams and, and others are just that deep restorative sleep. Yeah. And, and even when we're awake, there's still these like different levels of consciousness. You know, you've got daydreaming or or those times when you're so focused on something you totally lose track of time. Oh, yeah. All those things are just examples of how consciousness isn't this fixed state. It's more like a spectrum. Oh, that makes me think about 
those times when I'm driving and I suddenly realize I've been on autopilot for like the last 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. Like my conscious mind just takes a break and some other part of my brain is handling the routine stuff. Exactly. It shows how our brains are constantly switching between these different modes of processing, some more conscious than others. It's really incredible how the brain orchestrates all of that. Speaking of incredible things, one of the most dramatic examples of consciousness being interrupted and then coming back is when people wake up from a coma. Mm -hmm. What do we know about what's happening in the brain during that transition? It's a gradual process, usually. It starts with these like flickering moments of awareness that eventually become more consistent and, and stable. Research suggests that as the brain heals after an injury, you start to see more activity and more connections, especially in the areas that deal with attention, awareness, and higher level thinking. So it's like the brain slowly comes back online. Different circuits start working again until the whole system is up and running. That's a great way to put it. And this gradual reawakening really reinforces the idea that consciousness isn't just an on-off switch. It's so much more complex and dynamic than that. It makes you wonder, are there different types of consciousness? I mean, is the consciousness we experience when we're fully awake fundamentally different from the consciousness we experience when we're dreaming or, or when we're on certain medications? You know, that's a question that philosophers and scientists have been debating forever. There's no simple answer, and, and there are lots of different theories out there trying to explain these variations in how we experience consciousness. So it's another one of those big mysteries that keeps us fascinated by the brain. Definitely. Yeah. But even though we don't have all the answers yet, the research we've talked about today shows just how much potential there is in understanding consciousness. Mm. It's changing clinical practice, it's shaping how we understand the human mind, and it's raising these profound questions about the nature of our very existence. It's been an awesome journey exploring these ideas with you. And I think the biggest takeaway for me is that consciousness isn't just a thing. It's a process. It's this dynamic interaction of brain activity, communication, and prediction that's always changing and adapting. I completely agree. And as we continue to delve deeper into this incredible realm, I'm sure we're going to make even more amazing discoveries. Well, that brings us to the end of our deep dive into consciousness. Thanks to everyone for joining us on this wild ride. We hope this episode has sparked your curiosity and left you with even more questions than answers, because as we've seen, that's where the real excitement lies. Absolutely. Until next time, keep exploring, keep those questions coming, and keep being amazed by the extraordinary world inside your own mind. Well, my mindful molecules, we've ventured deep into the mysteries of consciousness today. From the unsettling reality of brain activity under anesthesia to the questionable nature of free will, it's clear that our minds are far more complex than we imagined. Keep questioning, keep exploring, and remember, your brain might know things before you do. Until next time, stay curious and conscious, or whatever consciousness really is.